everyone, and welcome to the eight, eighth meeting in 2019 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Um, we've received apologies this morning from Bruce Crawford, our convener, and from uh, Angela Constance. Um, and I welcome George Adam uh, to the committee as committee substitute. We've also received apologies from Alexander Burnett, who has uh, amendments on the fuel poverty bill, which is being considered by the local government committee, but he hopes to join us uh, later this morning. Um, and before we start, could I just remind members and witnesses, please, to put um, uh, phones into a mode that won't interfere with proceedings. Thank you. Um, the first and only item that we have on our agenda today uh, is to take evidence on Brexit from the Cabinet Secretary for Government, Business and Constitutional Relations, Michael Russell, and from two officials, Jenny Brough, uh, EU, from the EU Exit Readiness Team, and uh, from Ellen Lever, Head of Negotiation Strategy for the Scottish Government. I welcome all the witnesses to our meeting uh, this morning, um, and I understand from the Cabinet Secretary that he doesn't wish to give an opening statement this morning, so if I may, I'll launch um, straight uh, into uh, questions, and I think Cabinet Secretary will want to start um, with uh, no deal planning and the Scottish Government's readiness uh, for no deal. Um, I think we know that uh, nobody here wants uh, a no deal Brexit, but um, it is still uh, unfortunately a possibility that there might be a no deal uh, Brexit on the 12th uh, of April or indeed thereafter. So can I ask just for an, an update, Cabinet Secretary, on, on where we are uh, um, and where you are in terms of the Scottish Government um, with regard to, to, to readiness planning for that eventuality. Yes, uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I, I would confirm I don't think anybody in this room wants a, 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 a no deal, uh, as a result of which uh, we are doing our best politically to avoid that, and everybody should do that. But uh, we equally will do everything we can to mitigate the effect of a no deal should that take place. But I want to stress very strongly at the outset, we cannot do everything. Uh, and that should be understood. You know, this would be an unprecedented set of circumstances. Uh, you know, we have tried to cover all the bases, but clearly that would be very difficult to do. We should also be clear that a, a no deal uh, could reduce Scottish GDP by up to 7%. Uh, you've seen the published figures. This would be very serious. So we'd be dealing essentially with the effect of a very sharp, very sudden slowdown, uh, plus a number of other effects which are not uh, primarily economically related. For example, the interruptions to the supply chains. So uh, we have be, we've taken... Uh, in the Scottish Government, uh, a view that we should endeavour to deal with this through our uh, re resilience mechanism. I think to tomorrow will be the 16th meeting of the Resilience Committee, which has been up, uh, uprated and has grown in size very substantially to include a whole range of other interests. Local authorities, COSLA is there, um, food standards are there. There's a whole range of other interests who are round the table and who are taking part in, in these preparations. Um, we have also, as at the invitation of the Prime Minister, the, who invited the First Minister to take part in the UK uh, Exit Cabinet Subcommittee, which is meeting this afternoon in London. I was there last week. I've been to three meetings. Mr Swinney has been to two. I think the First Minister will be there this afternoon. And uh, we have participated in those meetings, which are it's essentially a meeting of most UK Cabinet Ministers alongside... Uh, the First Minister of Scotland, First Minister of Wales, and the head of the Northern Irish Civil Service. So uh, on the structural side, there's a lot of work going on. What we've wanted to do, and I have to say, I, I don't think I give anything away to say that in one of the papers for last week's meeting, the word interdependency was used, which is the first time I think I've seen it used in the UK government sense. There has been an acknowledgement that the, all the governments have had to work together because of essentially our responsibilities. You know, the Scottish Government is responsible for the delivery of the health service in Scotland. The Scottish Government has responsibilities in terms of civil order. All those things have to be done in Scotland, but they have to be done and are being done uh, in collaboration with uh, the UK Government. Um, just to say, in terms of where we are, our participation in the medicine stockpiling activity has taken place. Uh, you know, the, the, the Cabinet Secretary for Health is very actively engaged in that, has had discussions with her UK counterparts, and you know, as far as we are aware, and we've had reports on this too through the UK structures, that system is in place and ready to operate. Uh, in terms of food distribution, the retailers and others are reasonably confident that they can continue to supply, perhaps not completely uninterrupted with every piece of every item, but will be able to continue to supply. Uh, we have expressed particular concern about the ends of supply chains, which are in Scotland, essentially the north and west and the periphery of the country. 
and work has been done and continues to be done to make sure that the transport infrastructure is robust enough to cope with that. <coughs> and the uh, Transport Scotland, of course, has been key and much involved in that. Uh, in terms of the um, particularly vulnerable people, uh, Eileen Campbell, working with COSLA, has been particularly focused on that issue to make sure that those who are particularly at risk or are vulnerable can be uh, can be thought of and uh, structures and, and arrangements put in place for them. Uh, we have, of course, through the UK structures, been aware of the difficulties that would take place with export. Uh, you know, quite clearly, it's one thing to get goods into a country; it's another thing to to make sure that companies can export, uh, and particularly those who export uh, foodstuffs will be vulnerable. Uh, we have looked at and continue to examine and work on the possibility of a two-way process, so goods coming in can go out on the same in the same transportation, and that would be possible. But the biggest barrier to export, particularly in foodstuffs, will come with uh, phytosanitary inspection, uh, the confidence that the EU would have, for example, in foodstuffs going to them, uh, because they would no longer be, and you will appreciate this particularly with your background, there would no longer be a legal mechanism to enforce the regulations. If we were not in the EU, we would not be subject to European Court of Justice. The regulatory framework could not be enforced. And therefore, it is not a question of failing to trust people who are providing the same thing on a Monday that they were providing on a Friday. There is no mechanism to enforce that trust, and that is a key issue. So all those things are in place. We continue to, be, to, to meet, to discuss, to have the structures in place. There is a control room, a resilience control room now in place at Bilson Glen. Uh, and the first responders and the police, organised by the police, are, are, are fully uh, in operation. The 24-hour-a-day operation of the resilience room, essentially, that is the core of it, um, is ready to go at any time. It could have been uh, stepped up the week before uh, the 29th, which was the intention. That has not proved to be necessary, but we will review that on a daily and weekly basis. Um, and, for example, tomorrow we will discuss that issue again. Uh, we've also, through the score mechanism, been able, with the extra time, to do some deep dives on some of the issues that have arisen, so we are uh, reviewing and confident in our arrangements we've made. But I, you know, I conclude with what I started. Whilst we've done everything we can, I'm quite sure we haven't done everything. Thank you. That's very, a, very, a very full answer. One thing that you didn't talk about, however, was um, where the Scottish Government is with regard to budget planning. Uh, in the context of the, the possibility of a no-deal um, Brexit in April. Um, uh, perhaps it's a question for the Cabinet Secretary for Finance rather than for you, but we don't have him in front of us. We, we, we have you. So wh where are we in terms of um, budget, budget planning? There are two parts to the budget question, uh, and let me give you those two, two parts. The first part is that the consequentials that have come so far have gone into the system because the system is undertaking budget planning. So this has been distributed uh, across the portfolios and, and, for example, within the local government settlement, primarily for the work that is already being done. Right? So it's not a question of additional costs having been identified and those paid for. That is part of the normal process of government. What has been last year will be this year. <coughs> I think we're now in the second phase of that, which is over and above those monies provided what additional costs are being incurred. Uh, and um, he, he, the resilient structure uh, is being developed to uh, be able to apportion those costs and to ask people to come forward with those costs. And in a sense, a bill is being created of what the additional costs have been over and above the monies that are in the system. And that is where we are now. Now, the detail of that, you know, I can't give you. But certainly at some stage in the coming weeks, I think we will have an idea of what that additional expenditure has been, and that will be something that we should discuss with this committee. Does the Scottish Government anticipate that in the event of a no-deal Brexit, a, an emergency budget would have to be presented to this Parliament? Well, it, it, the UK Government says that they would have to present an emergency budget. We would have to present, uh, I think, broadly the same, but we would have to get additional resources from the UK. I mean, the principle we've applied from the beginning of this, and I've said this before to this committee, is that there should be no disadvantage, financial disadvantage, to any part of the Scottish public sector, let alone the private sector. Uh, there should be any financial disadvantage, and we would expect to, to have that money's, those monies paid to us. Thank you. I think James Kelly wants to cover some of these issues, but I want to bring Emma Harper in first, if I may, to talk about no-deal planning and freedom of movement. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Just before I ask my question, it's interesting to hear about medicine stockpiling, because I am one of those type 1 diabetics mm. who's an insulin pump user, and I'm still a wee bit wary of the continuity of future supply. But I suppose I can follow that up. 
Uh, all we can go by, and I, I know you are, <laughs> you know, uh, all I can, we can go by is the assurances we receive. And the assurances in the UK Department of Health is that insulin has been stockpiled by, I think, more than one manufacturer, so that would be available for an extended period of time. The other problem with the No Deal, and I just make this point, is we don't know how long it would last. Uh, and you know, if you look at figures that were out earlier this week, British uh, business has gone through an extraordinary stockpiling in, in recent weeks. There's a remarkable graph, which I'm sure we can provide to you, which shows the extent of stockpiling, which is unprecedented uh, you know, at any time in the last half century, I think. Now, apparently pharmaceutical companies have done this. Uh, the, these stockpiles exist. And uh, as far as we are aware, there are very few drugs for which there are not alternatives, even if they, the drug is not stockpiled. But insulin is a particular worry because it's not manufactured in these islands. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I am interested in what happens with a no deal on uh, with immigration. So there will be an immediate cease or stop of free movement. <coughs> and so that will have consequences for our hospitality um, businesses and caring. And I'm... I've raised this in chamber as well about dairy farming in the southwest of Scotland. So I would be interested to hear about what would be the consequences then with an immediate cease of free movement. Well, I think the first thing that people would notice is that there would be very restrictive border controls for a period of time. Now, they may not last forever, but, you know, the first reaction would be for there to be intense checks at the border. Now, we don't know what rules would apply then. The United Kingdom government has said that they are... It, it, not relaxed, but reasonably confident that there would be no particular slowdown in, in people coming in and out. But actually, if you look what's happened in the last month with French uh, immigration and customs controls being imposed uh, and people working to rule, there have been very considerable delays. You know, Four-hour delays, for example, on the, on the Eurostar. So in those circumstances, I think the, the actual functioning of the borders would become uh, you know, quite slow for a period of time. What migration rules would be applied would be another issue. Now, again, the UK government say it will have temporary migration me measures. There's a complication in this, of course, which is uh, the common travel area between Ireland and the UK, which predates the EU and which there is a commitment to continue. So I think there would be some confusion for a period of time. Um, and that would, there would also be, and that's legal, I think there would also be a matter of sentiment. People would not necessarily want to stay if they felt that you know, there were problems in living here, as a result of which I think you would see a, a, an increase in people leaving. And that would be problematic for the labour market, very problematic. <coughs> and we're seeing an increase in people leaving already, or, or like I'm aware that nurses and midwives are not registering with the Nursing Midwifery Council in order to come here from Europe. Is that still the case? Yes, and, and there are two issues at play here. One is the sentiment issue. You know, I mean, this is you know, universal. People want to go where they feel that they're needed or wanted and, and you know, will not be prejudiced. There will be no prejudice against them. People are, not everybody, but people are uncomfortable. The second one is the value of the currency. If the currency falls, then the benefit to people being paid in that currency falls, and, and it may not be worth their while. I noticed... Michael Gove had given this as a principal reason for slowdown in migration. Now, he is not entirely wrong, but you would have to ask, why has the currency fallen? Mm. You know, and the, you know, Brexit is clearly an issue in there. But people have other places to go. Now, in particular sectors, there's also very considerable competition. The health sector, which is always a shortage, European-wide. But, of course, agricultural labour is in short supply. You know, and that's one of the, the, the drivers within the, you know, the, the increased availability of agricultural permits, for example, from people from the Ukraine and the Ukraine Association Agreement. So that will be an issue. I mean, if you are working in, not just fruit picking, actually, in the, in, in, in the east of England. I noticed last week a, an article about asparagus growers in the, in the southeast of England who uh, are not, who think they will lose 20% of their crop this year because they rely, just as fruit growers rely, on migrant labour who will not be available to do so. Okay. Could you give a supplementary in this? Um, just very briefly, uh, the, the Minister came on the, the second part of that question to talk about the sentiment issue and the, the danger that people uh, from other EU countries who already feel very insecure for the last few years might make a, a, an urgent decision to leave. Has the government actually attempted to carry out any assessment to gauge the extent to which that is a risk, either in public services or in the rest of the economy? We both, both governments, 
know that this is a risk. I, I, we haven't done any quantifying, but we are seeing the experience of it. I don't know if the UK government has quantified. What we are doing, however, is mounting a campaign, uh, which will be live shortly, to encourage EU citizens to stay and to make it clear that they are valued and wanted. So um, we believe there is a sufficient risk, an evidence of sufficient risk, for us to take some exceptional steps to try and encourage people to stay. But there's, there's no... I haven't of, seen any evidence okay. of the exact numbers. I mean, I've seen drops, for example, as, as Emma Harper has indicated, in registration of nurses and midwives. Um, you know, there are many uh, people who talk to us about... And, you know, as individual MSPs, we'll have met people who have come to our surgeries who have said, you know, they're going away because yeah. uh, I can think of one in my own constituency, somebody from Germany who'd been around for... who'd lived in Scotland for 20 years who has gone back to Germany because they're uncomfortable. The... Settle status issue has been problematic. People do resent having to register, uh, and people who've paid tax all their lives resent having to, to register. And that is a factor. It's not, a, you know, not everybody's. I mean, and I think Scotland has been reasonably, uh, you know, clear that they want people to stay. And then there is there are elements such as the demonstrations we saw in London on Friday that that upsets people. Yeah. It really does upset people, and they feel threatened. James Kelly. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, convener. You mentioned earlier, Cabinet Secretary, that COSLA had been involved in discussions around resilience, which is entirely as we, we would expect. Why then, in terms of the £92 million that has been allocated for no-deal planning from the UK government, has none of that funding been passed on to COSLA to carry well, out necessary planning that they obviously will have to undertake? I, I, uh, I think there's a misunderstanding of, of what the system is in terms of how money flows. And let me be clear about this. And I'm not saying that there shouldn't be additional funding for local authorities uh, for Brexit preparations. I've had those conversations with Alison Everson. I continue to have them. I've encouraged, and I did it again last week, I encouraged Alison and, 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 and uh, Sally Loudon to quantify the costs that they are meeting and to make sure that that information is given to us. And I'm sure that that will happen. But, you know, the, the costs of Brexit preparation, the, very few of them have been separated out. You know, I mean, I suppose part of my portfolio is a specific cost of Brexit preparation. But what the procedure we've, we've followed last year, uh, this last financial year and this financial year, has to make sure that the money is allocated where people are spending money and money has been allocated in the spending settlement. And that's what's, what's been happening. And therefore, there will have been monies allocated right across the government. What we are now talking about is specific additional costs that are being met. And I, we are, I've made it clear, I think there should be money for them. But that has to come from the UK government. And we have to have it as part of our accounting process of what we are meeting. You know, what's happened south of the border is the direct relationship between the UK government and local authorities. That is a direct funding relationship. The funding relationship in Scotland is funding to the Scottish Government, and that money has been spread across the, 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 the portfolios of the Scottish Government. We are, however, concerned that additional costs being entered into now will require to have money given to them, and that's what the accounting we're seeking. But it, but it is the case that at this minute, none of the 92 million, which was allocated specifically for no deal planning, has gone to local authorities. No, it's not the case. That money exists within, right across the system, and you know, and that has been used by every part of the of the Scottish government. I am differentiating from the 92 million, which has been spread in that way and is helping us to meet all the additional costs right across the public sector and additional specified costs which we need to know about so that we can essentially draw up the bill. That is the distinction I'm making. But the, the £92 million pounds that has specifically come to the Scottish Government from the UK, none of that has gone to local authorities, no. and that, that is a position that's been outlined well, previously. I, I disagree with that position finance. with respect. I, I think that money is across the system and is being used uh, by every part of the system. But I do agree, and entirely agree, and I've made this point to, to Alison and to Sally and to other local authorities, they need to quantify the additional sums they have spent, as other departments need to do. I mean, this is a constant refrain from me and from the Cabinet Secretary, so that we have that bill ready to present. I'll leave it to that, uh, 
convener, but I would say that the position that you're outlining is a bit inconsistent from what we've heard, heard in previous parliamentary answers. Okay, thank, thank you for that. Alexander, I think you had a question on no-deal planning as well before we move on to other areas. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, convener and, and Cabinet Secretary. And firstly, my apologies for being late. I was in another committee speaking to my amendments in the fuel poverty bill. Uh, can I ask what the Scottish Government's doing in preparation for a no-deal Brexit to ensure the oil and gas sector uh, can continue moving goods and services to and from oil rigs? Well, we are in, in regular contact with the oil and gas sector. That goes through the, uh, the, the appropriate departments in the Scottish Government. And whatever assistance they require to have, you know, we will be looking at whether we can provide it to them. But they, we've tended to find in this that in the private sector, people know what they need to have, and they're making arrangements to have it. So, for example, if I look at some other sectors, they will be trying to charter boats. They will be trying to make sure um, that they are protected in stockpiling. For example, I imagine as oil and gas there will be issue, issues of, of equipment which come from other parts of the EU which they will require to have, you know, either in spares or in... And that will have to be... Presumably has been stockpiled. I would have to check with individuals, but presumably that's been stockpiled. I can give you other examples uh, in the public sector. Uh, for example, Caledonia McBrain was looking... Uh, as, and I, Again, I don't know whether, how much they've done of this, but they were looking to see if they could purchase spares for some of the vessels that had been built in Poland uh, so that they had those available rather than having to get them. So I presume that that has happened. Um, there are areas, however, that the oil and gas sector cannot prepare for because those require decisions from either ourselves or the UK government, and particularly the UK government in terms of migration. I would again expect uh, uh, that there would be a flow of labour of some sort, probably highly specialised labour, from other European countries which could not be allowed for uh, in terms of the question that Emma Harper asked earlier, if there was a more restrictive migration system. So I would think there would be three things taking place. One is, uh, and I'm sure it is taking place, a discussion between the Scottish Government and its officials and, and the sector uh, in terms of what any special things that need to be done, a preparations that the sector has done and rightly done, and there's a lot of businesses have done that, particularly accelerated in the last couple of months, and some things which are regrettably insoluble because those require decisions by the UK government in terms of migration or the EU in terms of regulation, which cannot be presently anticipated. Uh, thank you. I'm sure your uh, um, remarks at the beginning is certainly applicable to the larger companies who have been able to uh, spend more time and resource on preparations. Uh, but for the smaller companies, can I ask what's being done to maintain the supply chain uh, in the UK and ensure that the flow of services can continue? <laughs> In a no-deal Brexit. The best thing that could happen is that there shouldn't be a no-deal. So we continue, and we said that at the beginning. I don't think there's anybody in this room who wants a no-deal. <coughs> and if any of us have influence on that, they should use that influence. Uh, but in terms of small companies, a number of things right across, not just now, the gas sector, have been applying. One is we've had um, particularly strong support from Scottish Enterprise, Hans Nans Enterprise and Skill Development Scotland in its Prepare for Brexit work. And that has shown a big uptake in, in, in a big increase in uptake in recent months. And that allows companies to assess, small companies particularly, to assess what the impact is upon them. And you know, we have encouraged people to do that. If companies haven't done that, then they need to do it. Even now they need to do it. So if anybody is watching this and has the opportunity, go and do that now. Uh, then, you know, there are, in Scottish Enterprise and Hans Nansen Enterprise, Skill Development Scotland, uh, people they can talk to about the way in which they can get additional help in the supply chain. But their professional associations are also important as well. You know, they will, they will know their peers and they will know how these supply chains work. And those supply chains need to be negotiating with those businesses and businesses need to be approaching them. We can't clearly approach every, you know, uh, every contractor and say, this is what you need to do, but they need to know that that's happening. Um, there are UK systems, if they export, for example, there are UK systems whereby they can register and get up-to-date information. But we can't legislate for what happens when a lorry gets to Zeebrugge or gets to uh, uh, Cali. You know, there will be issues in there in terms of compliance, uh, which are not entirely clear at the present moment. But all those things are available, all those things have been available, the information has been there. And I, I we launched the prepare for Brexit update last year. Um, and you know, so far, that's worked particularly well. And we've also ad added additional resources into the system, finally. Uh, I think we put two million in earlier this month to help businesses do more preparation for Brexit. And we'll go on doing as much of that as we can. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Um, I think we want to move on now from no deal planning to uh, the possibility of there being an alternative to a no deal, which is obviously a deal. Uh, and uh, Neil, I think you wanted to kick off questions. Thanks, this, convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, there's obviously been a lot of votes in the House of Commons um, last week and on Monday evening. I wonder if you could clarify uh, why you, your Westminster colleagues abstained on Ken Clark's proposals for a minimum of a permanent customs union. Yeah, because it does not include uh, freedom of movement, uh, and that's absolutely crucial to us. Um, we've never supported a customs union per se. You know, we, we believe that it is the single market and customs union relationship together that is would make the difference in this. Now, uh, we did not support Nick Bowles in the first attempt because we didn't think that that was clear enough. There was negotiation over the weekend, and negotiation can produce results because there was negotiation over the weekend which produced a clearer text from Nick's, Nick Bowles and assurances which we thought were satisfactory, and we backed his resolution. Uh, and you know, it is very similar to, there are some differences, but very similar to the position we took uh, in December 16. A customs union on its own does not do that. Uh, and a customs union on its own does not provide the, 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 the protection that we need, and particularly in terms of regulation. A customs union uh, it, you know, not only permits, but allows very substantial regulatory divergence. And it is the, regula the, 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 the regulatory divergence that is the problem. Um, in addition, freedom of movement is absolutely central to this. The Scottish economy needs freedom of movement. There, there is no doubt about that. You know, I mean, I've used at this committee before the example of the Highlands and Islands as a region that will lose 20% uh, of its workforce in the next five and ten years because of demographic factors. You know, it, that will lead to very substantial con uh, continued depopulation unless that labour force is replaced. There is no clear way to do so without the present freedom of movement arrangements, and that's what we should go for. So that's, that's simply why. Uh, thank, thanks for the answer. Um, I mean, I realise your preferences for no Brexit and for maintaining freedom of movement, but I think the key phrase in Ken Clark's proposal was a bare minimum of a customs union. Therefore, what, if you wanted to go further, you could still support that 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 proposal. Are there, are there any if it, that proposal is to come back as a minimum of a permanent customs union, are you are you willing to? Compromise at well, all in that? Not unless it was uh, it would have to be fleshed out so that we understood it. I mean, with the greatest respect, and I, I, I do accept take Ken Clark's word, but you know, a bare minimum from what is a backbencher isn't actually very reassuring at this stage. It, there needs to be more than that. But I think what we need to focus on on Tuesday was you know that old Westminster maxim: the vote follows the, uh, the voice. You know, uh, in a sense, we know what people supported. They supported the customs, the common market too, and they supported a, a, a referendum. So those would seem to me the two big areas where it would be possible to coalesce around. And you know, we would want to see what happens. Now, you know, this changes hourly almost. We don't know what Jeremy Corbyn will take to the table. Uh, the First Minister is in London today too. We have our absolute clear views and we do think ignoring Scotland by refusing to you know, discuss this with the Scottish Government today is, uh, so far is, is, uh, is not a sensible idea. But that being said, I think that you could get movement, continued movement, around a common market too and a referendum. And I think that's where the focus might be. Uh, I would much rather not have a Brexit. And I would, if there is to be, I think having a confirmatory vote is absolutely essential, given the changes that have taken place over the last two and a half years. Thanks. Thank you. Willie, did you want to follow yes, up on this? Thanks very much, Convener. I mean, that Cabinet Secretary, that Ken Clark motion that my colleague referred to, 10 Labour MPs actually voted against that as well. So. I mean, we could nitpick all day about who voted for what option, really, but where, where do you think we are in the space of trying to get some kind of agreement and a deal? Um, the Prime Minister clearly looks as though she's finally accepted that her deal can't go through. She's had three attempts at it, it's not going through, and she's opening up these discussions with Jeremy Corbyn and hopefully others too. Where do you think we might be coalescing around some kind of deal that might get a majority? I'm not sure the Prime Minister does accept that her deal won't go through because it seemed that her statement last night was open to a number of interpretations. Um, but that being said, I mean, I, I think there's little point in taking her deal back to the House of Commons as it is because I, I think it's inevitable that it would be defeated again. Even some of the people who voted for it on Friday seemed to have voted against it. 
So I think we need a pay calm, so uh, you know, we, the, the clock is ticking. Uh, I think also, I think it's very difficult to interpret the EU Council decision on the 22nd of May as anything other than saying if you're going to have an extension on the 22nd of May, you have to have elections. Uh, I think that's very clear in the Council decision. I don't see anything in the coverage over the last couple of last 24 hours has changed that. I, for the purpose of argument, I believe there should be European elections. I'd positively welcome them. I think the preparations, you know, clearly have been made in various places, but they can't take place unless there is a decision to allow them to take place. I, I think they should take place. I think that there should be a much longer delay. I think that people should be encouraged to have their say. A people's vote is entirely right to happen. But you know, at the present moment, it's very difficult to say what will take place in the next 24 to 48 hours. Allegedly, the Prime Minister wants a conclusion to this by the end of this week. I think that's probably flexible into Saturday. Um, those, in those circumstances, the EU also wants to know what the proposal would be uh, for Council. It is very difficult to see what that proposal would be. But if I were able to wave a magic wand and, and get what I want, you know, apart from no Brexit, which I think you know, has been a complete distraction and disaster for the last two and a half years of, of really damaging, massively damaging proportions, then I think it would have to be a very long delay, a referendum, the European elections taking place, and perhaps some calmness coming into this to look at the damage that would be done by proceeding along the present lines. Mm. Are, are you getting any sense at all that the MPs, political parties, are, are willing to to compromise even a little further to get some kind of deal. I mean, it seems to be fairly intransigent at the moment and people swapping sides on both sides of the thing as we go along. Are you getting any sense at all that there's movement towards getting a deal? Because the one thing that we all seem to be agreed is that nobody wants an audio. I, I think you'd have to be pretty hard of heart not to have been pretty downcast last Wednesday and last Friday. I think it would, you know, I, I, and again this Monday, I think it would it does try everybody, and you know a lot of people are very affected by this and are very profoundly depressed by it. And, and I worry about all of us in that sense, and I certainly worry about those who are at the very centre of it. But I think you you also ha always have to try and take some brighter note from what is taking place. If I go back to the negotiations over the weekend with Nick Bowles over his resolution, that was possible to get a, a coming together uh, in order to do something, and I think that's positive. Uh, you know, I regret, for example, that the, uh, some MPs did not support that, you know, because clearly some of them thought, you know, some Liberal MPs clearly thought from the evidence that by supporting that they would be weakening the case for people's vote. I don't think that was the case. I think in a, in a ballot where you were allowed to choose as many things as you wanted, I don't see how that could be the case. So I think there is movement. I think people are focused on things. What will come out of discussions with Jerry Corman, I don't know. But if there is, <coughs> as the Prime Minister seemed to indicate, a commitment to accept the outcome if there were a multiple choice, not just one thing, but a multiple choice that was voted on, that would be interesting. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, I, I share that sense of uh, frustration and, and, and anguish at the, the various outcomes of the uh, votes that we've seen in the House of Commons in, in recent uh, days, Cabinet Secretary. I mean, do, do you, would you agree that we are you know, w well beyond now the point where we can, any of us, insist only on our first preferences in this? And we, and we have to accept that in the interests of reaching a compromise, and it is going to be a compromise, um, that we are going to have to, you've used the line, you've used the phrase uh, many, many times before, uh, red lines. We're going to have to rub out red lines. Now, you, you, you've been very consistent in that you uh, in, insist uh, that any form of Brexit must continue to have uh, single market membership and membership of not just a customs union, but of the uh, customs union, as it's understood with regard to the common commercial uh, policy and the single tariff. Wh where is the SNP prepared to compromise in order to ensure that we don't leave without a deal, given that that's now, that, that is now wh where we are? We are all having to you know, not insist on our first preferences, or perhaps even on our second preferences, but on outcomes that we <coughs> agree are suboptimal mm -hmm. in order to avoid catastrophe. 
Yeah, I think you have to recognise that compromise is not about accepting the lowest common denominator, right? And I make I say that point very seriously. You know, it, it is certainly about being able to bring to the table a flexibility in discussion, but it's not about saying <coughs> what's the least we can all agree on. Uh, I think there are very strong reasons for saying that without freedom of movement, for example, there are real enormous problems for Scotland, which cannot be very difficult to overcome. That being said, you know, and, you know, we've had our differences on this in the past, but I genuinely believe that from the very beginning, the stance that I've taken on behalf of the Scottish Government you know, has been one in which we've attempted to compromise. We put forward, in Scotland's place in Europe, what we thought those, that compromise would be. We've had no willingness to do so for two and a half years. So, of course, I welcome if there is a willingness to do so. And I think we are edging towards that. But, you know, my first preference is not to do this. And, that, the, the, you know, and that's what Scotland chose not to do in June 2016. Accepting a common market too, which is leaving the EU, is therefore very much a compromise on our part. Very much. And, you know, there are, for example, even in Common Market 2, some issues about flanking um, policies which are not clear and not problematic. But I'm, at the end of the day, I accept that there can, needs to be continued discussion and, therefore, things may change over the next 24, 48, 72 hours, OK? But I don't, I don't think I would want it to be understood that we were not compromising. We have compromised very substantially. Whether there are more compromises to be made by everybody will be an issue as we see over the next 72 hours. But, but a compromise that takes the United Kingdom out of the single market is one that you would not be prepared to make under uh, any circumstances, uh, well, I, e even, if it, even if it was the only way of avoiding well, a no deal I'm Brexit. not saying that, uh, convener. Uh, and, you know, I think probably that type of language from me wouldn't help in the next 72 hours, right? Uh, I'm saying where I think we are and what we've said consistently, and how we've tried to bring that to the table. I mean, you know, I've, I've lived, ate, and breathed Scotland's place in Europe for the last two and a half years. You know, sometimes people in my own party have been unhappy that I've espoused that as a compromise. So, but I still believe that that is workable, but I would rather not do it. And I think the evidence we've seen so far is that not doing it might be the best choice. And you know, the, the thing that squares all these circles is the people's vote, because it does, in the end, say the political system cannot reach that decision. <coughs> Let the people reach that decision. Thank you. That, that, that's helpful. I know Patrick Harvey wants to come in in a minute, but I'm just going to bring George Adam in first. Just now. Yeah. Uh, just a quick supplementary. Uh, <coughs> thank you, convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. I've been watching all this from the relative calm of the Scottish Parliament, but you've been up and... Well, yes, uh, but uh, when you look at... Uh, you've been down in the bear pit that is Westminster at the moment, and it's like a three-ring circus down there. No-one can agree with what day of the week it is, let alone anything else. So we, not to labour the point on compromise, how do you see the, po the potential for a compromise at this, position, at this time, considering the heat? And uh, the, the the way things are, the, the way the discussion's been had down in Westminster, how do you see scope for being able to find that? I think a three-ring circus looks wonderfully well organised compared to what you witness at Westminster most of the time. I, this has produced a lot of heat. All of us you know, will have said and done things which you know, we look back and think, gosh, I, I, you know, that really got under my skin and I might have said things I shouldn't have said. All of us would have done it. Uh, I think this particular moment is a is such a serious one that I think everybody has an obligation. As, as people tried to show on Monday, everybody has an obligation to think, and I think I, I wrote this on, on Sunday, and I'm just repeating what I wrote in, 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 in my column on Sunday. I, I think it is really important that people say to themselves, what is best for my, the countries, because there are four countries involved, what is best for the people I represent? And I think that should be very much at the forefront of their minds. I think that, uh, therefore, debate, discussion, negotiation is really important on a genuine basis. And that's what I think everybody will be trying to do in the next 72 hours. But it is tough. You, know, that, that you can't ever throw away the past. And there's, people are pretty wrung out by this. You know, the last two and a half years has been very tough for people at the heart of this. And this bit, 
you know, every day you get up in the morning and think, what on earth could happen next? So people need to have a calm sukh on this now. The thing is, Cabinet Secretary, we're, we're effectively at Brexit minus five days mm -hmm. and the public are getting to the stage where they are asking desperately, you know, what is the future? Where are we going? And uh, for me, I like to try and keep things simple. I'm a simple guy, just want to get on with life. It's very difficult uh, for the public to actually under, be able to understand why politicians in Westminster will not sit down and actually agree with one another. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, you, I mean, it's not an analysis that would be shared universally around this table, but you and I would believe that it illustrates that the Westminster system is broken, and I do mm -hmm. think it illustrates that. I think it's been in a process of being broken for half a century or more. But, you know, at this particular sharp juncture, I think we have to see what, whether negotiation can produce a result. Patrick. Thank you. Um, Cabinet Secretary, a few minutes ago you said it was, uh, it was unclear whether or not the Prime Minister would be willing to meet with the First Minister. Uh, while you were speaking, a UK minister was on television uh, and said that there is absolutely no point in Theresa May uh, meeting with the SNP over Brexit, to which the interviewer said, we're just hearing that May is to meet Nicola Sturgeon today, uh, and the minister replied, that's fantastic news. So uh, I, I think events are clearly... Fluid. Fluid, somewhat. <laughs> Mr. Have you've illustrated perfectly the world in which we live. Having said that, if the purpose of these meetings with the Prime Minister uh, is to make the generous offer to Jeremy Corbyn and others, perhaps, to share the blame for Brexit, uh, would you agree that they need to be very, very cautious uh, about that, that process uh, and what the, what the real intention and, and purpose behind it is? And do I take it from your comments so far that the, the compromise that is conceivable from the Scottish Government's point of view uh, is that whatever deal might end up getting support has to be put to the people, that that is a requirement? Yes. With a Remain option on the ballot paper? Uh, well, I, I don't think you could possibly have a, 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 a second vote without Remain being an option. I mean, that would be inconceivable. I, I, from the very beginning, I've made it clear that would not be possible. Thank you. That's but very yes. clear. Murdo. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Actually, I was going to ask a question about the, the, the second referendum option, and I think you've been quite clear responding to Patrick Harvey. So ju just, just so I'm clear about this, is it the Scottish Government's view that a second referendum is required in all circumstances? I, I'm, I'm sure, like me, you would not want to <coughs> appear to be an extremist of any description. So, perish the uh, so uh, indeed, perish the thought. So let me put it this way. I think that the best outcome of this has, would be a people's vote right, on a, a, an option. Right? And you know, we can discuss that. But I never will absolutely say never. I, I made clear to Patrick Harvey, I think that is essential. You know? But I just do not wish to close any possible avenue. And I take the convener's line on this. I don't want to close any possible avenue in the next 72 hours. But, you know, I think it would be very difficult to justify refusing to take this to the people. OK. And if, if there were to be a second referendum, and this is all entirely hypothetical, I appreciate it at the moment, and it's a very fast-moving territory, but say, say we ended up with, a, with a, a, a referendum giving a choice between the withdrawal agreement as it stands and remain which I assume would, you won't remain on the paper, so that would be something the Scottish Government would press. And let's say there was a narrow vote, 52%, 48%, in support of the withdrawal agreement. Would the Scottish Government then accept that needs to proceed? I think it would depend on what the vote in Scotland is. I mean, I've been, yeah. consist well, I've been consistent from the beginning. I mean, you and I disagree on this matter. You know, we're not going to reconcile each other on this issue today. I suspect we will never reconcile each other today. I think that a situation in which the people of Scotland continue to support being members of the EU and uh, were denied that option for a second time would be insupportable. But you know, I'm not sure this is... You, know, you and I have exchanged this, I've exchanged this with members of your party you know, over the past two and a half years. Uh, that's the position we have. You know, we're not going to be able to change that today. Okay, thank you. Can I, can I ask a, a related question, not about referendum, but about revoking? Um, as I understand it, it's Scottish Government policy that Article, that the, that Article 50 should be revoked. Um, is, is that correct? Yeah, so we, we would be very pleased if that were to happen, particularly this morning. Um, uh, in the Miller case, the Supreme Court ruled that to invoke Article 50 required bespoke legislation, that the Prime Minister mm -hmm. did not have that uh, legal authority. 
Um, in the Whiteman case, the European Court of Justice decided that it's for the United Kingdom to decide whether it wishes to revoke Article 50 or not in accordance with the constitutional requirements of the United Kingdom. Um, what can you tell us, if anything, about what the Scottish Government's understanding is of what the constitutional requirements in the United Kingdom would be were the decision to be taken by the Prime Minister or, or by the Cabinet that Article 50 should be revoked? Does it require legislation in the light of the Miller judgment or not? I, I'm, I really think it would be very dangerous of me to, 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 to bandy words with you about this issue because you are far better positioned to argue this than I am. Um, I think I would I, 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 My position is I think it's plausibly arguable either way. <laughs> and, and what I think you have yet again I'm, proved and, and why I'm, I'm not I'm, going to get involved in this. And what I'm interested, no, what I'm interested in is, okay. what, does the Scottish Government have a legal view about, I, I, about this No, matter? I don't think it does. Right. Uh, should it have? Uh, perhaps it should have. Um, my own view is it is arguably either way, and I'm glad that such a distinguished lawyer has confirmed that with me. Um, but... <laughs> You know, I don't think that's the issue. If we got to the position that revocation was the political decision, then I think a way would be found to revoke you know, in double quick time, that, uh, whether that was by emergency sort of, legislation or by yeah. other means. Right. That's the sort of argument that might not stand up in the Supreme Court, would be my, would be my advice. But let's, let, let's leave that one there. Uh, Emma, did you want to come back on this question of <coughs> compromise and deal-making? Well, I am interested as... You know, the mood in Westminster is obviously different than the mood here in our parliament, you know, our young, sensible, sane parliament here compared to what we're seeing unfold in Westminster. But I'm interested in whether there are people um, that are moving towards compromise, that are open to negotiation, debate and discussion in order to, you know, not have us go down the no-deal route. Well, I think that we've seen from the indicative votes that there are people who are very keen to find a way forward, and there are those who are still stuck in their trenches, you know, and will not move from those trenches. And there'll be some people who are stuck in those trenches forever, you know, without a doubt. I mean, you know, I think particularly on the ERG side, I mean, there are people who will never, ever accept anything other than the, the hardest of Brexits, and that's, that's presently where they are. I think the Scottish Parliament, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to do a sort of here's Teus was like us you know, presentation, but I do think the Scottish Parliament has tended to show an ability to work across party, uh, which has been more impressive. I mean, we have been able to seek, well, on the continuity bill, you know, there were differences, but in the leading up to the continuity bill, we were able to get almost unanimous views that there shouldn't be uh, an imposition on the Scottish uh, uh, Parliament in terms of its, its, <coughs> its, um, its obligations and rights and, and, and duties. Uh, and competencies. Um, and in, since then, we've also managed to get pretty substantial majorities, you know, two-thirds, three-quarter majorities of the parliament for certain propositions. So I think we've shown a way to work together, which has been helpful. It's not perfect. You know, there's been some pretty heated debates and discussions. But I, I would have hoped that that would rub off and people would recognise that. And I think there are people who recognise that at Westminster. It's a different it's system. I mean, you know, you can go back to... 1997 and 99, and the desire of those people who established this parliament to have a different system. Now, it's not entirely worked. Politicians are politicians. They will be adversarial. But there is a, a different, you know, standing orders make a difference. The way in which the parliament is laid out makes a difference. All those things create a bit of a difference. Okay, thank you. Tom. Thank you, um, convener, and good morning, cabinet secretary. The the process so far of negotiating and attempting to pass the withdrawal agreement has been variously characterised as the easy part of Brexit, the simple or straightforward part, with the future agreement viewed as being the most contentious element. And I think many of my constituents would be deeply alarmed at that prospect. With regards to the situation we now find ourselves in, based upon your experience over the past two and a half years, what have been the reasons behind the current um, impasse that we face? What aspect has been political, the decisions of politi politicians? What aspect has been related to the culture of institutions? And what aspect has been constitutional, i.e. the legal relationships governing these islands? It's a, it's a very interesting question. I mean, I think it will be a matter of considerable analysis in future years. Why it, what took place in June 2016 went so terribly wrong. 
and I think there are um, you know, many reasons for it. I think the first of which you know, has to lie, to, and I'm being very straight here with the Prime Minister, I think that there were two fatal flaws in the approach. One is that the, the desire to keep a, an ambiguity about what the UK wanted uh, you know, in order to keep the broadest coalition of our own party on side was very damaging. It was only the Chequers Agreement in June last year uh, which resulted in them writing down what they wanted. I mean, they should have written down what they wanted in a quasi-legal text in the first month. And I think that was a big problem. That's when the, the, the disintegration of the government started, because people started to resign because they couldn't agree to what was written down. The second uh, uh, issue in there is a failure to bring people together. Uh, and this has been commented on again and again. Andrew Ronsley had a very good piece on, on, at the weekend, which I, is, I would, re, would repay reading on this. There was a moment, and I suspect that moment was probably towards the end of 2016, where it was clear there were major decisions to be made, for example, at that stage, whether or not we would be in the single market in the customs union, because we should remember that was still up for grabs until the Lancaster House speech in end of January, so, January, January 17. Uh, so there was a moment to sit down for the Prime Minister to bring together, you know, not now, but then, Jeremy Corbyn, Nicholas Sturgeon, Carwin Jones, Arlene, uh, you know, Northern Ireland uh, Assembly was, was still in operation, Martin was still alive, to sit down with everybody and to say, how could we actually get something that would command the broadest support? That never happened. I mean, that isn't what happened at the JMC in 2016, the first one since 2014, the JMC plenary in October 16, where essentially the Prime Minister simply said, Brexit means Brexit. She actually said that, you know, uh, without defining it. And without any indication of how it would happen, and without seeking a consensus around the table of what it meant and how you could move forward. Because we published our paper in December 16, which argued for customs union and, uh, and, and single market membership. And I, you know, I remember sitting in David Davis's office in the House of Commons saying to him, this hasn't been ruled out, has it? No, absolutely not. It hasn't been ruled out. You know, this is still on the table. And a week later, we had the Lancaster House speech without consultation, without seeing a text, without knowing what was happening. So that is a failure to it. But then you're alluding to something that then underpins all this, is how the, 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 the evolved administrations work with the UK government. And the problem here is, is really a long-term problem of what devolution is and how it operates. Devolution is essentially a system of compromises built around the concept of parliamentary sovereignty at Westminster. I think that is impossible for, to continue in that way. And I think the weight of Brexit has finally il illustrated that. Now, my preferred solution is a relationship of equality, uh, where you have an independent Scotland working with an independent uh, England. But you know, there are, and I addressed this last week in a lecture I gave to the Institute for Government, which you know, if you haven't got, I'm, I'm happy to provide. I do think that you have to accepting that that is what we want to do. If we take part in a debate, even in the short term, about intergovernment relations, we do it on the basis that there needs to be a new settlement. And that settlement needs to be defined by a, a different relationship between the parts. And I think it also has to be defined by a means by which you enforce that relationship. I constantly quote the Taoiseach's remark from, I think, the British Irish Summit, uh, British Irish Council I I last year in Jersey, where he talked about the relationship of trust within the EU between the countries, depending upon essentially the way in which that could be enforced through the, the European Court of Justice. I think in the intergovernmental relationship, you will require to have, for it to work, something that is justiciable. But the problem with that, before the convener points it out, is that it is not possible to do that within the concept of Westminster sovereignty. And that is the conundrum that we require to be solved. Devolution is not about a hierarchy of governments. Governments have defined roles. It is about a hierarchy of parliaments. And how you resolve what has now become, I think, the difficulty within that is the big issue for there is a, an intergovernmental review um, underway. Uh, it hasn't gone anywhere yet, but that is the big issue for the IGR. Thank you. Um, I think there's a couple of other issues that we want to talk about um, before wrapping up, Kavino, and one of them is the continuity bill. Um, and Neil, I think you had a question about that. Yeah, it was just um, on the con continuity bill. Where, where are we with the continuity bill in terms of addressing the, the ruling of the Supreme Court? Okay, uh, I have been <coughs> meeting with representatives of the parties. Uh, there is, a, I hope, an agreement of how we're going to take this forward. 
and uh, the issues forward. And there is a draft letter which I'm seeking agreement from the other parties to before I send it to the presiding officer. Now, I think it would not be possible for me, because it is still in draft and being discussed with other parties, to go into any detail about it. But I think, I hope we could have this resolved within the next few days. I mean, uh, uh, Neil Finlay has the letter. I think he has said it's OK. I'm waiting to have response from others. I'm sorry that the timing of this is not quite as good as it could be. But we are in a position where I think we'll be able to resolve this. Uh, I think I probably can say that I don't think it would be possible for us to move to a reconsideration stage. But the rest of it, I want the detail to be agreed by the parties, as that's what I've followed through. So I understand what you're saying about cross-party engagement. What, what, what role will it be for Parliament to scrutinise what, well, what, what you're suggesting? Once written to the presiding officer, I will, of course, be open to question and scrutiny <coughs> on this issue. Um, and I'm happy to do so through the questions in the Parliament or, through to, or to this committee again uh, to say what I, how I think we should take things forward. But I, I, I feel I should, you know, having done this through a cross-party basis, wait for that letter to be approved. Uh, and I'm not quite clear, uh, Cabinet Secretary, how, how this committee fits, fits into that. And this committee spent a long time uh, scrutinising uh, and uh, debating amendments to that, to that bill, um, uh, not late into the night by Westminster standards, but late, certainly late into the evening by Holyrood standards. Um, w w when will this committee be told what the Scottish Government's view is about the future well, of that legislation? And because it is a question of whether or not to take a reconsideration stage at this stage, I intend to write to the presiding officer to say what the government's intention is with that bill. It is a government bill. I will ensure you are cited um, on that, uh, and the committee is cited on that. When that happens, I'm waiting for the agreement of the other parties to do so. I said at the very beginning, I think that I would want the other parties to, to seek a, a common agreement, a common position. That's, that's what I'm trying to do. Okay, thank you. A any other questions on the constituency bill? Um, I, I have a question about, about frameworks, um, uh, Cabinet Secretary. The um, uh, committee published a, a report on common frameworks, um, I think, uh, on Monday of last week. You will have uh, seen it and, and hopefully uh, studied it. I don't expect a, a full um, response. We'll get, a, we'll get a written response from the government in, in, in due course, I understand, before the end of this month. But there is one issue that was raised in that report that I would like to um, uh, get you on the record about today, if I may. And that is that you know, a, a theme which has emerged from the parliamentary scrutiny of a number of LCMs relating to so-called Brexit bills is concern about the provision of delegated powers to the UK government to legislate in non-reserved areas currently within the competence of the European Union without seeking the consent of this parliament. And I wonder if you had any reflections on uh, the concerns that this committee has talked about, I think now in three of its reports on, on that matter. And, and do, you sh do you share these concerns? And if so, how do you think they should be uh, addressed? I do share those concerns. Um, uh, I would want to look at the issue of how they would be addressed in my formal response. But I can certainly say we do share those concerns. It is, a, it is another illustration of the fact that there is a, an ad hoc system operating which impinges upon, the, the, in my view, the proper operation of the Scottish Parliament. So I share those concerns. Uh, I would want to respond in detail and to work with the committee to resolve the issue. I, I, think, I think the committee is, is concerned that, the, the, that these are I issues which are dealt with in as open and transparent a way, rather than negotiated and agreed, as it were, behind closed doors by, by ministers and officials. Uh, I, I think that's the specific set of concerns that the committee would, that would and, want and to bring to the table. I agree it's undesirable uh, to do it that way. Um, one of the pressures on this, of course, has been the weight of that material in the, the, the last six months because of the no-deal preparations. I agree it's undesirable. I don't think it's something that we would want to continue. I want to find a way to make sure that there is, it is more transparent. I, I, you know, I was very keen and remain very keen, as we, as we saw with the um, protocol between the government and parliament on how to handle the the, the big increase in SI, so that we have as much transparency as we possibly can. I am keen that that continues and expands. There is, for example, the issue whether or not it happens, but there could be quite a weight of Brexit-related legislation coming to this parliament you know, in the next three to six months, and I want to make sure that is done in a very transparent way as well. And some of that legislation will contain the same issue. Mm. Thank you for that. Final question, Kavina. Um, yesterday there was a lot of um, discussion, um, including on Twitter, of a possible recall 
of this Parliament during the recess. What would be the purpose of any recall of this Parliament during the forthcoming recess? I think there would be three purposes for the recall. The first of which would be to ensure that members are updated on arrangements for <coughs> no deal. These are very serious arrangements. We would want every MSP to be aware of what they are and to be able to scrutinise those arrangements. So that would be the first one. Uh, the second one would be to update the Parliament on any political issues or issues of sensitivity that have arisen during the, the, the last week, essentially, if we meet next Thursday and Friday, in the light of negotiations and the implications of any ruling of the European Council. The third one, I have to say, is to do with what I think members would want. I, I would be surprised if most members did not want to be uh, at the forefront of, of ensuring that the devolved competences and interests are looked after and defended and scrutinising that at a time of no deal. I, I don't, I'd be surprised if members wanted to be elsewhere when that particular moment of crisis, because it would be a moment of crisis. I mean, we've been in a perpetual crisis, but it would intensify the crisis if next Thursday and Friday we found ourselves uh, essentially with a no deal. So that would be the purpose. So the, the, and all of those purposes relate to a no deal Brexit? On, they do. On, on, yeah. They, they, they do. And uh, the problem with the timing of this, convener, is that we may only know whether or not that is happening on the evening of the Wednesday Indeed. with the European Council. So you know, I, I think, therefore, it is likely we will meet on the Thursday at the present moment, barring something happening in, in the next few days. That's very helpful. Thank you very much. Um, can I thank the witnesses for their contributions this morning and thank all members? I think this... Oh, sorry, Patrick, you want to want stop? The, yeah, uh, sorry, Patrick. Point. Um, you, you touched, Minister, uh, Cabinet Secretary, earlier briefly on the, the question of European elections. Uh, over the last days and weeks, it has felt more uh, hopeful that we will still be in the European Union in one shape or form uh, for, for the longer term uh, than it previously did. Um, is, I know you're not, in, in terms of cabinet ministerial responsibility, directly uh, uh, responsible for European election planning, but is it the Scottish Government's view that we should work on the assumption that those elections will take place and are the, the arrangements being made uh, at local level for the administration and organisation of those elections. I am actually the minister responsible for election planning, oh, I so, uh, so, so I take that responsibility on. Uh, these elections, however, are, are, are organised by the UK as a member state, not by uh, the, the, the Scottish electoral administrators. They, they administer them, but the driving force for these is the UK. You know, if we had the ability to do ourselves, we'd do ourselves, but we don't. But in those circumstances, uh, yes, I mean, there is a cut-off date. The cut-off date, I think, is the 15th. I think it's the 12th for the European Council. The actual cut-off date is the 15th. So a decision will have to be made in the next week. Unequivocally, I believe they should happen. I would want them to happen if we are... You know, and I think the EU's position is that they really have to happen if things go beyond the 12th. So I would hope they would happen, and we will contest them very vigorously. I appreciate you're not in the position to, to press the, 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 the go button and say we'll, we'll conduct those elections, but... Organisations which are under devolved control, local authorities, yeah. schools, the police would be involved to mm -hmm. some extent or other. So, you know, are you confident that they are working to the assumption yeah. that that may well be the case? Uh, knowing electoral administrators as I do, and having got to know them, you know, over the last uh, few months, although I was a member of the Arbuthnot Commission on voting system things, so I've had a sort of abnormal interest in this for a long time. I have, <laughs> uh, I have to say that I am absolutely confident that Scotland's electoral administrators will be prepared, uh, and you know, the moment they are told that this is going to happen, they will do so efficiently and effectively. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. I'd like to thank the witnesses for their time and contributions this morning and thank all members as well for uh, the tone of the questioning this morning. I think this has been um, a session perhaps unusual given the subject matter that has shone light on the issues rather than generated heat. And I'm grateful to everybody uh, for that. And with that, I close this meeting of the Finance and Constitution Committee.